There's so many other things we could still be talking about in church history. Obviously, this has been a survey introductory class uh, for you to be exposed to this. Hopefully, it's enough to uh, stimulate some continued interest. Uh, not necessarily I expect you the week after you're out of school to go dive back into a deeper study of church history, though that would be nice. But in the years to come in your ministry, whatever that may be, that, that you've sort of got a foundation to work from. I think I mentioned this at the very beginning of the course. One of those places I like to keep going back to myself, and I have it up here on the screen, is churchhistoryinstitute.org. This is an organization that's been around since at least the early 1980s, and they put out at usually a quarterly magazine on some aspect of church history. There was a tough time when the finances were kind of bad and they only put out one or two issues in a few years. But they've got them all up on the web for you to, to download and read free. Now what they have up there is the text of all of their magazines. They're, the magazines are also heavily illustrated. So if you find one that you just particularly like and would like to see what all... Uh, charts and pictures and other things, maps they had in there with it. I think you can buy a copy of the, the full magazine for like $5 and they'll ship it to you. But certainly the text is there and uh, I continue to find myself going back and, and visiting that. Uh, you know, showing the most recent ones here. Uh, the, the Catholic Reformation, which we didn't even talk about. It happened in the late 1500s and 1600s. Uh, Let's see, what is this? A, a whole issue on the Quakers. Uh, one on Calvin and the councils and the confessions. I'm just reading some of these off. Luther. I think they have three different issues all together on Luther. 25 writings that changed the church and the world. Charlemagne, which we only just mentioned just briefly in one class. The first, or one of the, considered to be the first really emperors of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh... Uh, Modern Persecution, Billy Graham, that would be one for you, Edmund. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, the View of Heaven during, <clears throat> down through the ages in the Christian faith, different views of that. Uh, Christianity in Early Africa, the Stone Campbell Movement, that's our restoration movement they're talking about. Uh, just, uh, you know, issue after issue. I think, uh, what are they up to here that they show? Issue number 125. So we're talking about 125 issues of the magazine. And I just point that out as, as a more exemplary place on the Internet that you can get a great deal of information for free uh, about particular subjects having to do with church history. So at some point in the future when you're uh, maybe teaching or just for personal study, I want to know more information. This is one of the places you can go and uh, get uh, more than likely find what you're looking for and have it boil down to a form that uh, you're comfortable with. Now, today our topic is, uh, as we've been doing here the last several classes now, special studies in church history. Our study today is on the sacraments of baptism and communion. Our uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper or depending on which fellowship within Christianity you are, you might say uh, uh, baptism and the Eucharist. And uh, there's even other expressions also that uh, different fellowships use to describe what we normally just call the Lord's Supper or communion. And those two expressions are the most common expressions in uh, Western Protestantism today. That's what... Uh, most other religious groups who would be considered, especially the evangelicals, uh, would consider a normal way to refer to uh, this, this thing that Jesus instituted the night before he died and that is one of three practices of Christianity that dates from the very beginning until now. And those three things are baptism, the Lord's Supper, and meeting on Sundays. Those all predate any written records we have of early Christianity. They're actually the earliest testimonies, not just to Christianity, but to a couple of the fundamental beliefs of Christianity. You know, I have these critics, as we keep referring to them, who 
Uh, some have argued that it wasn't to the middle of the second century or maybe even the end of the second century that that Christians really all believed that Jesus rose from the dead and and uh, things and that he died on the cross for their sins and that sort of thing. That that just doesn't hold up when we have these very very early records showing that way back into the early first century, shortly after the time that Jesus lived, that they're already practicing baptism. And what did bap baptism signify? An imitation of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It was a testimony about that, but it was also a testimony of in Christ they had forgiveness of sins, which again, that contradicts this idea that Christians didn't even have that idea until in the middle of now, the second century, over a hundred years later. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the Lord's Supper. It was a remembering what He did for them until He comes again. And that was a part of the confession of the early Christian community in the belief that Jesus had a, not only risen from the dead, but ascended to heaven. <coughs> and is coming back. And then, of course, the meeting on Sundays. So it wasn't the only day they met on, but suddenly... The first day of the week took on a new significance by the middle of the second century. And that significance was, that was the day that he rose from the dead. They didn't so much celebrate one day of the year. That would come late in the second century. They would start doing Easter and start having their arguments over on what day you should celebrate it. And eventually the Eastern Church... Uh, would, would settle on celebrating it on the same day uh, that Jewish Passover fell, no matter what day of the week it was. Whereas in the Western church, they uh, went to celebrating it uh, almost universally on the, uh, the first Sunday after Jewish Passover, according to the calendar they were using at that time. And it's shifted a couple of times in history since then. I think the most recent time they tweaked the exact day, the exact Sunday of the year they would do it would be sometime in the mid-1500s. They, they worked on it again to try to get it uh, the way they wanted it. So it's kind of interesting that way. But again, uh, celebration of Easter was very late. But celebration of Sunday is very early. And all three of these practices of the earliest church all testify to the fundamental doctrines that make up the Christian faith. Who Jesus was, what he did, he rose from the dead, he's gone to heaven, he's coming back. And that's all in those practices that they were doing long before anyone was even writing anything down about it. Michael. Did, did you speak on the aspect of uh, the Easter uh, being pagan like? Well, certainly there are arguments that uh, it, it seems to coincide or come close to s some celebrations that were already going on in the Roman Empire. Uh, I don't think the link for that is nearly as strong as the link for Christmas is, actually. I think, you know, because Christmas fell right at the, the, uh, the winter, the beginning of winter, the shortest day of the year uh, kind of thing, which is along, what, December 21st, 22nd, and then lo and behold, they start celebrating the birth of Jesus on the 25th. And in some traditions, others uh, on the 24th or on the 28th or on January the... The other they ate the day of the kings or, or whatever uh, cultural tradition, our church tradition you're a part of, but they're all right in that category. So, Let me ask you this. Why wouldn't we, sometimes it comes down to individual households, mm -hmm. but why wouldn't we, um, as followers of Jesus, uh, being in this post postmodern age, mm -hmm. why wouldn't we, if we want to uh, become all things to all men, and we, and we know that most, um, I'll just use these two religions, uh, Islam um, and Judaism, uh, would push back and say, you're doing things like pagans. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we as the Lord's Church say, for the sake of right, being as true as possible mm -hmm. to the New Testament, do away with that? Mm -hmm. And I know it's some of our traditions, right? You know what I mean? And we yes. lose the, the sense of Christmas and everything mm -hmm. else. So, do you have any, maybe just personal words on that? Uh, I don't have much I could go into depth on. I would even have to think about it some more to respond to it. I, 
you know, there's so much that is a part of modern Western civilization that is rooted in paganism of one every day of the week, every month of the year is named after something in paganism. Mm -hmm. You know, the Sun's Day and Thor's Day and uh, Frida's Day and so uh, Saturn's Day and so forth and but, so well, you know those were, those actual, uh, yeah pagan gods yeah and Roman gods or Norse gods in some cases uh, same thing with our our months of the year uh, again I'm not I'm not saying one justifies the other I'm just saying at some point you just say you know that's sort of what can, has come down to us and and while we're not honoring or uh, celebrating the pagan aspect of it, we recognize that is what is now recognized in our culture and uh, so forth, uh, not for what the paganism was, but what, what was uh, the ultimate end of it, which was giving days, names to days of the week or names to months of the year. And, but I do think as Christians we ought to be very careful uh, around these ma these two major holidays that are often counted as Christian holidays. The one thing, one side, I don't badmouth them because right. that sounds like I'm, I'm somehow st standing with the critics right. who are rejecting the birth of Christ and the death of, mm -hmm. and resurrection of Christ. And on the other hand, uh, I don't know that we need to necessarily go to all the extremes that we see in some of our religious neighbors. They have these huge Christmas celebrations, these huge... Right. Easter celebrations and yet I go look in Romans chapter 14 and it says that every person every member of the body of Christ if they keep a day holy they need to keep it holy to the Lord right. and if it's not if it's a day that does not seem to one that they personally seem need to keep holy then they're, then they're right. still just as pleasing to their Lord yeah, yeah. yeah and so I think we need to have a great deal of um, respect and tolerance for each other and uh, do worry about the excesses or uh, things like that but at the same time uh, if, if I do remember Easter and I have to tell you when I get up on uh, Easter Sunday morning the first thing I do is pray and thank God that my Lord Jesus Christ rose on Sunday morning whether it was that Sunday morning or not <laughs> and uh, and almost every year I have an Easter sermon yeah, yeah. Not, not, not preaching that we should keep that one particular day special, but that we should remember that our Savior rose from the dead and that made everything different. Yeah. And, that, and so that's sort of where I fall on those kind of things. Thank you, Chairman. But uh, what we're going to look at today are, are two pra these, not all three of these practices, again, baptism, Lord's Supper, and Sunday observance is almost universal across Christianity. Obviously, there's a few groups that uh, practice uh, Sabbath worship, Instead, uh, there's the Seventh Day Baptists that do that. There's a, you know Seventh Day Adventists also do that. Some of these groups, not all of them, but some of them have some other deviations from what's considered uh, normal or mainstream Christian doctrine as well. Especially the Adventists, but uh, still the vast majority do 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 Sunday observance. The vast majority do have some something they call baptism that is supposed to reflect back on this original practice of the early church. Uh, the Quakers might be an exception to that. The Quakers do not practice either communion or baptism, uh, arguing that it should all be taken in a spiritual sense, not a physical sense. And so you might go get that issue on Quakers and read more about their views on many things. Uh, but, uh, but the vast majority do all three of these things. And we're going to look at two of them this afternoon, these two practices, baptism and the Lord's Supper, our communion, our Eucharist, or other terms that can be used, have traditionally been called in church history the sacraments. Now, sacrament is, is uh, not actually a biblical term that is the word. And the way the word sacrament is used today is essentially mean a Christian right by right, we mean R-I-T-E, practice, a Christian practice that is believed to have been ordained by Christ Himself. And we might even put a little parenthesis and say, or by the apostles. 
and that is held to be a means either of divine grace, that is God's grace being administered to us through that practice, or is a sign or symbol of God's grace for us. And after that, after that sounds like we're trying to, you know, cover all of our bases by defining it that way as we look at this today, we'll see that in the church over the centuries, different groups have landed in different points of that. We did when we were coming through the timeline view of church history when we got up into the 4th and 5th century and maybe even a little earlier with men like Origen and certainly by the time of Augustine and others like that, they were advocating that things like baptism and communion and even last rites and other practices like that as sacraments was actually God's grace being bestowed upon that person. And that you couldn't be saved without them. Mm. And it's not that we're arguing that you can be saved without baptism or without keeping the Lord's Supper either, but they were saying the acts themselves bestowed salvation. That God chose in the acts themselves to bestow salvation. And we talked about it then, we'll have to talk about it now, is why did they start emphasizing it that way? Is because they started having, during some of the persecutions, some of the ministers, some of the priests, some of the ministers of the church, uh, during time of persecution would renounce their faith. So they could get a, a libellus or a libelli, you know, a little piece of paper that said that they had made the offering to the the gods or to the emperor so that they wouldn't be executed. But then after the persecution was over, people started saying, well, that guy baptized me. Does the fact that he's now fallen away from the faith, does that mean my baptism is invalid? Right. And so the church started trying to resolve that problem, that answer that question. And the answer they finally came up with is that the, the power is not in the administrator but in the thing administered, in the baptism itself, in the communion itself. And so even if uh, a man fell away from the faith after having baptized many people and after on a weekly basis was administering the communion to his congregation, if he fell away or if he was labeled by the church later as a heretic and that his teachings are banned in the church, they would argue that nevertheless, when he administered baptism, when he administered communion, that was still effectual to grant God's grace to those who received it. So, yes? Well, what would you say to the one who says, um, the one who's actually baptized um, with the understanding of one Lord, one faith, one mm -hmm. baptism, um, yet the one who baptized him uh, believes it's uh, symbolizes right mm -hmm. or it's more spiritual than it is literal right. um, what do you say to those who would say ah he didn't have authority uh, in the Lord's church to baptize you so therefore you're not in Christ Jesus well it's really the same question isn't it it's the same question they were trying to ask and I've even had people worry about the fact that they say well I know who baptized me but I don't know who baptized him and I don't know who baptized him. And I don't know if we can trace it all the way back to the New Testament and one of the apostles or evangelists. So I don't know if I've been scripturally baptized. I don't think that's the issue. I don't think the issue is so much who baptized you and whether they themselves were baptized correctly, but rather the reason for which you were baptized and based upon what you were believing at the time that it took place. I think that's the effectual thing. And uh, you know, I've had I've had uh, I've, I've been approached um, very uh, very kind of chameleon like uh, <laughs> by the brother and uh, by the brothers and when they when they made a comment it was almost like that one true church type mm -hmm. mindset, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like where was you baptized at? You know what I mean? Uh, and somehow maybe trying to check my uh, my origin, right? You know what I mean? And so, uh, but anyway, I asked just because I, I wanted mm -hmm. the feedback. And I understand why that would do concern people. Yeah. Uh, but if we can just talk through it together and think about it, mm -hmm. 
we're, we're talking about things that when we read the commands to be baptized and the reasons people were baptized in the New Testament, this is not an issue that ever came up. We, we don't have any record, at least, where ever was it said, now make sure that the guy that baptizes you uh, isn't Demas because later he's going to fall away. And so if he baptizes you, then later falls away, then your baptism's invalid. Well, you might fall away. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that just really wasn't ever the issue. Yes, sir, Brad. They've always said that the Scripture never, ever puts emphasis on the one doing the baptizing. So right. that's what, that was the answer to, to help Michael ask yeah. that I've always heard. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm helping my brother. Mm -hmm. I was just actually getting feedback from, because we actually live in that, and it's very, very common. You will, um, or maybe those who, who you've been around maybe have approached, or maybe we have a, uh, a stigma that we approach people like that. And so we want to be gracious and patient right. and, and process things. Well, I know a lot of places it's where you're baptized, not mm -hmm. who, it's where. Where yeah. you're baptized. That's yeah, true. That's, that's, that's true, too. Right. That's what I want. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's another that's issue. And and where in the sense, not just whether it was in a in a lake or a stream or a baptistry in a building, but what, what was the name on the building at the time it happened? That's or, not what you're getting there, right, Joseph? <laughs> yep. Yeah. I was baptized in the Baptist church. Uh -huh. Was Pentecostal, but you know they don't do baptism. Right. Pentecostal, yeah. so. Right. But, so and so let's let's talk. Let's look a little bit now at baptism in the New Testament because I think this is some foundational stuff that uh, may help us out later on. You'll find those who will argue when they try to look at Christianity strictly from a naturalistic standpoint. These would be almost entirely people who really don't believe in miracles, don't believe in the resurrection, don't believe Jesus was any more than just a really good man. Uh, who was a little mis misle misled about who he really was and let misled others. But they will just, from a strictly naturalistic standpoint, say, well, you know, Christian practices just came out of Jewish practices. And they'll, one of the ones they'll focus on particularly is baptism. They'll say, well, it is no different than, than Jewish washings. And so I've given you in the notes here some uh, thoughts from my perspective at least about what was so different about Jewish washings, which date all the way back to the law of Moses. Priests were to be washed before they began their, uh, both their initial ministry and each time they went into the tabernacle and into the temple area again, they washed before they could actually begin their service. So yeah, there, there was this washing going on. Yes, Sean? Um, this is sort of a deep question, but could you give a specific example of the way one, like say a Baptist believes that you should be baptized in a river or natural body of water only, uh -huh. something like that, and maybe text reference of scripture? Or is it just based on, like, like you know what I mean? Like, how do they come across this? Like, oh, I gotta wash everything, so I gotta go into the water clean, so and so. I mean, it's whatever. I'm not trying to mock mm -hmm. the process, right. the line of thinking. To each, to each their own, as long as it's not. Mm -hmm violating scripture, right? right. Uh, as long as it's not denoting God's word. But, uh, you know, could, could you produce an illustration as, with, with what you just said in versus maybe scripture mm -hmm. or a perhaps doctrinal belief? Well, my thought is, again, with what Brad said just a while ago about the emphasis is never on the who, it seems there never is any emphasis in the New Testament on the where from the standpoint of what kind of body of water it was. We know the Ethiopian eunuch was baptized on the side of the road, whether it was a stream, a lake, a pond, or whatever it was. Probably wasn't an open baptistry they had built out there. But then uh, at other references, it's always on people being immersed, whether it was in the River Jordan, with the early ministry of Jesus and his disciples, or it seems seems clear, though it doesn't say it in the text, in Acts 2, when those first 3,000 are baptized, they were probably baptized in the Jewish mikvotes, the, the washing stations that were located outside of the temple itself. Those were there for that very purpose, although the intent was different, washings as opposed to baptisms, but uh, it just never seems to be any emphasis on where it's ne never any instruction given to make sure you find living water, flowing water, in other words, or as later in the second century, one of the earliest references to how they baptized, they said it needs to be uh, living water if possible, it needs to be cold if possible, not warm, and, and uh, uh, all those kind of things. But that seems to also something be added on later, and I think maybe 
uh, people's thinking today is still touched by whatever background they came out of and what the tradition was of the fellowship they were a part of and so they sort of have a tendency that way. I, I, I suspect there are many in the churches of Christ today because they've only ever seen people baptized in a baptistry. If you would say, well, you know, today, uh, because it's a nice day and everything, we've got three people that want to be baptized today, so let's go down to the Y and let's baptize them in the pool there. And people say, is that scriptural? You know, there's going to be people who will be thinking that. Is that okay? It's, it's, uh, it's not that they're wrong in thinking that way, but, you know, we just get used to certain... <laughs> Uh, when I was in California, it was very common, even in the congregations that were located along the coast, to go out and baptize people in the ocean. Now that's quite a challenge, but uh, they, that, that was very commonly done. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Right, what they were until you got here and actually saw one or some. Yes. I. <laughs> <laughs> Mo you know, growing up, most of the people I knew and that my father baptized and that I baptized, we didn't baptize in a baptistry. We didn't have a baptistry. I was not baptized in a baptistry. I was baptized in a stock pond across the street from my house. And uh, my mother went first and made sure there were no snakes swimming in the thing before my dad took me down in the water and baptized me. But... Uh, but, you know, these, these Jewish washings, let's sort of get back to that now. Uh, these Jewish washings that are anchored in the law given by Moses, both for the priest as well as uh, people who are part of the congregation of Israel, when they did something or were touched by something that made them unclean, it might be uh, after a woman's... Uh, menstrual period, it might have been after a family member had died and they as a family had prepared the body for burial. Uh, they uh, might have uh, many other things are listed back there in the Old Testament that would make them unclean. Now unclean did not mean out of a right relationship with God. It simply meant that they were not holy or clean so they could actually go into the presence of God at the tabernacle or later at the temple uh, without that somehow being acknowledged and dealt with. And it was dealt with by washing. Along with a certain amount of time, they were excluded from uh, access to uh, the temple or the tabernacle and a few other rituals that they might go through, depending on what, what made them unclean. And so it's anchored in the Old Testament in the beginning of the law among the Jews. Now, God put that all there not just because he wanted to burden people with a lot of unnecessary things, but rather he put that there as a way of pointing to some spiritual reality. This is not allegorizing like uh, Origen would have done or something, but, but rather it was a, a message was there. This was telling them something more than just that they needed to be clean before they came into God's presence. It was pointing to something about their present relationship with God that you just can't assume that we on our own are always in a condition to just come into God's presence. We need to take care of some things before we do that. Yeah. But even beyond that, it says there's something coming in the future in which God's going to address that in a far greater way. And, and so I, I like the Gospel of John because all through the Gospel of John, he will keep using uh, the word signs. He would talk about these various things that were signs mm -hmm. about Jesus. And interestingly enough, that word even in New Testament times meant something that pointed to or indicated something in the more specific way we use the word sign today, which might say one way or turn left here or you know whatever. 10 miles to Brownfield, whatever it might be, where we use signs today. And literally all through the Old Testament, everywhere you look, once you start realizing this, God was putting up signs, <laughs> pointing to something. And they were all pointing to the same thing, still to come. And so these washings end up falling into that category.
uh, by the New Testament time, the Pharisees in particular had multiplied the number of things which you uh, needed to be purified from. And they had multiplied their emphasis or magnified at least, their emphasis upon being washed. And so many of them would wash three or even five times a day just so in their own minds at least they, they would feel like they were clean in the presence of God. Even though they hadn't touched anything dead, they hadn't had done anything else that the law said would make them unclean, they would wash multiple times a day. When I was in Israel two years ago, one of the places we had the opportunity to go is an underground museum. They've dug down to the level of the New Testament period of time and they've excavated just about a whole city block underground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the ruins of the, the houses, I believe there's three of them that are exposed down there. The ruins of them, they were all destroyed in the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. So there's burnt timbers and mm -hmm. other things, but parts of walls are still standing, mosaics on the floors. This was a rich section of Jerusalem and in the New Testament time, thought probably where the high priest and the other higher priest in the priesthood lived because it's right across from the temple. But when you go down there and you start going through there, like the what they call the high priest uh, palace or the high priest mansion that's down there, there was at least five uh, mikvahs in the house. Now, these, this is not the same thing as our bath tubs or our showers in our houses because these were not used for normal washing. There were in this one house at least five ritual baths which shows in the minds of whoever lived there and, and probably as they passed through several generations, you know, the next generation would move in when this one would pass away. So like the pastor's house or something or parsonage. Uh, but uh, it shows there was this great, uh, not just emphasis, but uh, almost unreasonable emphasis upon washing. And that was true in many regards. And so Jesus had to address that. You know, his disciples were criticized because they didn't wash their hands before they ate. Uh, they, they were picking grain on the Sabbath day. You know, all sorts of little seemed to us petty things they were being criticized for. He was being criticized for. And washings was very much a, a part of that as archaeologists still to uncover more of the city of Jerusalem and other cities in that land that date back to the New Testament period. They find more and more of these uh, mikvahs. Uh, mikvahs is how we would say them because one is a mikvah. If you have... A, uh, more than one in, in uh, Aramaic, it was mikvahot, that was the plural of it. When we even went to uh, Qumran, the place out in the desert along the Dead Sea where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered starting in the late 1940s, that Qumran community out there, these people who had withdrawn from public uh, participation in Jewish life and lived in this uh, remote area, almost a monastery kind of situation, I believe there were seven mikvotes in Qumran in a place that would only house about 250 people. And they had been very careful to create a water system that caught what little bit of rainfall there was off the sides of the mountain just above them and they channeled it all the way down the side of the mountain into their community and into and out of each one of these uh, mikvotes because they had come to believe that the water needed to be fresh and flowing as much as possible. So, it, but, so there's all this emphasis. But in the notes here, I point out that what did, what did they say about these washings? First of all, their washings didn't in, involve just people. It involved their certain objects. They washed certain pieces of furniture in their houses. Now, we don't know that they immersed them. We're not sure exactly how that could happen, though... Some of those mikvotes in those houses were big enough to put anything but your, your refrigerator in, probably. and Because uh, they were huge. And, but, so they, they would wash objects. They would wash their dishes. It was beyond just, again, cleaning them. They would ceremonially wash them, dip them. So they would be clean in that ceremonial sense, not just in the physical sense. They uh, would uh, repeat it 
as often as necessary, which for people was sometimes the Pharisees would be three or even five times a day uh, for their dishes and their houses would be every time before they ate, any cup they drank out of, any pitcher they used to pour water from before they put any water into it, it would be ceremonially cleaned in this way. You can see how, I think you can see how burdensome this would become after a while. You spend all your time just administering <laughs> the washings uh, in your life and so forth. And so the, the washings were continual and repeated. Uh, the washings might involve just part of the body. Sometimes they would just wash your hands and wrists. Other times they would wash the whole bodies, depending on, again, what they were doing. Uh, it was for ceremonial cleanliness. It really had nothing to do with sin. Our right relationship with God from the standpoint of sin's view. So it had something to do with the relationship with God in terms of being clean or unclean ceremonially, but it had nothing to do with sin itself. And yet when we then lay that over in contrast to baptism, first of all the baptism John started preaching, then Jesus and his disciples picked up and for a while followed him in doing, and then finally with what I call Great Commission baptism that Jesus ordered his disciples to start doing after his resurrection from the dead, there's a big contrast between that and the Jewish washings. Among them is that baptism was only of people, actually of believers. Whereas for the Jews, their washing was both people and objects. We never read anywhere where people were told to, instructed in any way to be immersed or baptized on more than one occasion. The washings were sometimes daily for the Jews, but this baptism that John and then Jesus, the disciples, and then the Great Commission all instructed, and the practice we see in the book of Acts and mentioned in the epistles afterwards, were just once per person. And immediately upon their uh, acknowledgement of their faith and desire to enter into this uh, relationship with Jesus, uh, it, was, it was by immersion. That's the word that's used. Uh, just about any scholar you read, even those who are part of fellowships that only sprinkle a little bit of water on infants' heads today will say, yeah, it was immersion to start with. Yes, sir? You see, um, what do you say uh, possibly to those who say um, <clears throat> about John's baptism? Um, and John would even say, um, I'm I am preparing the way for the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, you see the the Great Commission baptism being set up. Right. Use that for just a, just a small word. Set up by John, uh, established by Jesus, and then the church being established in that mm -hmm. with the apostles. Um, what do you say to those who uh, would say those who were baptized by John? If they uh, would have, let's say, died, right? Mm -hmm. um, during that time, before the church is established, mm -hmm. uh, were they saved or were their sins forgiven by John? I think John would even answer. He would say, um, I'm baptizing you, right? Water unto repentance for the remission of your sins. Right. Um, what do you, what do, you do you have any feedback? Well, my, my thought is, based upon just, you know, the simple face of the, the story we have is that when people were immersed by John, they were baptized uh, for their forgiveness of their sins. Yeah. And if they then passed away before the Lord, uh, before the day of Pentecost, which by the way, did you know this Sunday is Pentecost? Uh -huh. This Sunday is Pentecost. It's 50 days uh, afterwards. So it's the beginning of harvest. That's what Pentecost was for. The celebration of the beginning of the harvest. And that's what... That's why after the resurrection of Jesus, he, they waited till Pentecost to begin the preaching of the gospel. The harvest is now beginning. Mm. So, yes, Sean? It's funny. I, I, um, I will be preaching on the 20th. I was going to prepare a sermon on it. I still might, depending on how this weekend goes. Uh, but I was talking with somebody. I'm like, yeah, this week is Pentecost. They're like, no, that was Easter. I'm like, I Googled it. And it's, no. this is yeah, but I Easter was at Passover, then Pentecost was on the 50th day after. Right, right, yeah. exactly. Like I'm, I, I could have said that, but they would have just looked at me. Right. Like, mm -hmm. what? So I'm like, well, 
Hey, Google's an authority too. <laughs> <laughs> so, check, check, my brother. So, today being pin up, did somebody else have a hand raised up? No? Okay, I don't want to skip you guys. Um, um, so, today being, you say Sunday? Yeah, this coming Sunday. Yeah. This Sunday is Pentecost. What day would it be? It would be the 20th of May. It would be the 50th day after the celebration of Passover, or the Sunday after Passover, actually. And then 10 days before, yeah. obviously, the yeah. uh, Pentecost is 40, when Jesus obviously ascended, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That is, uh, and, and I knew that, the reason why I'm, I'm thinking about it, I'm just thinking about my son right now, right. you know, being born on May mm -hmm. 3rd, and, and, you know, being able to tell him, say, like, you were, you were born, my son, like, right you know, 50 days, like, you know, 3, 40, and 50, right? The, mm -hmm. One of the greatest numbers for the Christian right. to understand historically, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so that's going to be amazing to be able to tell them this. Right. Well, back to the earlier question you had an asked, I, I do believe that John's baptism was for remission of sins. It says it was, yeah. that people were saved in doing that. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we say, well, what about those people in Acts chapter 19 that when Paul meets them in Ephesus, he has he rebaptizes them. It seems that they were baptized much later after, you know, John had said to his own disciples, I must decrease, but he must increase. John was saying, my ministry is going away. But I think maybe some of his disciples either didn't understand that or didn't want that to happen. And so there are some very fragmentary records from the first century that indicated there was a, a group of sort of Johnites, if we want to call them, or maybe Baptists, if we want to use that term, okay. that, that continued his thinking after him even after Jesus had come and the church began. Some of them ended up being associated perhaps with a movement we run into near the end of the first century called the Ebionites. The Ebionites... Uh, did not have in their teaching Jesus as being the Son of God. He died on the cross for our sins, that He rose from the dead, that He returned to heaven. Their teachings sound almost identical to John's mm. near the end of the first century. And perhaps, and I am say only perhaps, these people that Paul encounters that had come up from Alexandria in Egypt, which was a center for Jewish scholarship for hundreds of years, had, had been touched by some earlier version of that thinking that had gotten mixed in with John's actual ministry. And so they had been baptized by that because they really did want to be ready for the coming of the Messiah. But they just hadn't yet, the gospel apparently either hadn't gotten to Alexandria while they were there or they just were not in the right place at the right time to hear it. And so then when they come up to Ephesus, then they meet Paul and then they find out yeah. that... That uh, yeah, could they say what you know we've never heard of yeah, that they so to speak they bought war bonds and the war's been over fifty years, <laughs> you know that you don't you don't need to buy war bonds anymore that's already done done and gone, yeah. and and so then they said well we need to just get this straightened out and while we were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah we didn't realize he'd already come, and so then that, for that reason I think is why they were baptized again John's baptism in that sense was no longer effective from the standpoint that it had been replaced by that which it was intended to be replaced by yeah. already. And they just didn't know that yet. But there's a, a wide range of differences between these Jewish washings and Christian baptism, starting with John. John's baptism and later Jesus and the apostles, as far as we know, and certainly with great commission baptism, was baptism only of people, only one time, only by immersion. It was for the forgiveness of sins, not for... Uh, spiritual cleanliness and to escape some kind of uh, uncleanness in that figurative sense but literally unclean before God because of our sins and it was commanded by the Lord and uh, is propagated by his apostles and is anchored in the very earliest uh, records we have of Christianity and there's no indication in the New Testament itself that we that anyone confused those two. The Jews continued to do their washings. Even as Christians were growing in number right in Jerusalem itself. No one seemed to 
At least we have no record of anyone saying, well, look, I was washed just yesterday as a Jew. Why do I need to be baptized today as a Christian? Mm. <laughs> you know, that it's, nobody's confused those two, even though the outward thing might look similar in some ways. Somebody goes down in the water and gets totally soaked and comes back up out of the water. That, that looks pretty similar either way. But everybody seemed to just innately know those were not the same things going on. So perhaps this will help you one day when you'll run across someone who says, well, Christian baptism really just had its origins in Jewish washings. Well, maybe in a sense it did and that the Jews were already familiar with the concept of needing to be washed to be right with God. But more than anything else, Jewish washings as it was originated in the law from Moses was all a set of signs pointing forward not just specifically to baptism itself, but to the time when at last everyone could once and for all be clean and wouldn't be unclean after that. So, sir, yeah, right. yes. Circumcision was mm -hmm. Well, circumcision is a little different subject. Uh, you know, Paul will will talk about how that you know we're. Uh, a circumcision takes place on our hearts. Correct. Uh, and he's actually tying back to what he is a Jewish scholar before he became a Christian would know that in the Old Testament God would tell them, I don't want you to just be circumcised in your flesh. I want your hearts to be circumcised. Right. Some of them were just counting on the fact that they had at eight days of age, the men, mm -hmm. uh, been circumcised physically. And God said, but your hearts, even as adult men, is still not circumcised, so you're not right with me. And Paul said that at last happens for all of us uh, when we come into Christ. That's that one, Old Testament obviously was a sign. Mm -hmm. of yes. The covenant, right. In covenant, born, um, and obviously when we're baptized into Christ, that's no longer like a sign of, hey, it's coming. No, it happened. Right. Like yes. It's, mm -hmm. it's a reality. That's right. In Christ Jesus. Yeah. Now, with John's baptism, as we've already alluded to, it was, it was intended to fade away. It was only a preparatory set of events. God had made him the forerunner, and uh, God gave him something new and different than what had been done before. That is, the actual baptism for forgiveness of sins. That was something new. As, and the Jews were, the majority of them, convinced he was a prophet from God, though he never did a miracle or anything like that. They, his, you know, just his presence, his message, and so forth, it was very convincing to them that he was of the same type as those men of the Old Testament that they call prophets. And God has sent him as the one to run ahead, to go ahead of the actual uh, king of Israel himself. And so it's no surprise then that when Jesus comes, not only does he say, I'm the one John was talking about, and not, not only does John say, he's the one I'm talking about, they point at each other, but also that Jesus also baptizes, not just shortly after his own baptism by John, but when he gives a great commission. That, but there's a big difference. John's baptism had a particular purpose, to prepare people for the kingdom to get ready for it. Jesus says, this is the baptism I'm commanding is for all people everywhere. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Now that's Mark 16 and we know some of the earliest copies of the manuscripts of Mark don't have that section in it. But I'm still convinced that it is a part of the original scripture. That it just some of the earliest copies Again, copies of copies that somehow that last page got lost before the copy was then made, and that's why the copy is missing it too. Uh, but in other parts, it is there. But, but it's not just Mark 16. In other words, Luke, that repentance and rem remission of sins be preached to all nations. We see in Acts chapter 2, when the apostles start preaching, they're saying that, uh, that they needed to believe the message. They needed to understand that they needed to uh, repent and be baptized to have their sins washed away. And that was the standard practice throughout the rest of the book of Acts, and as far as we can tell. Very different than John's, where John never even 
seem to imagine a Gentile being baptized. Anyone except the house of Israel. Uh, but the baptism of Jesus is talking about is for pe all people everywhere, <coughs> all over the world. And that's, that's a practice that's continued then until now. And that's what that we're doing. Uh, I keep calling it Great Commission Baptism simply because that seemed to be a convenient way to designate it, even though it's not referred to it exactly that way anywhere in the New Testament, even like the Great Commission doesn't appear in those words anywhere in the New Testament. But uh, obviously this baptism was ordained by Jesus as a part of the preaching of the gospel to all the world. We see it practiced throughout the book of Acts in obedience to Jesus' instructions then. Uh, some of the things that are connected with it, uh, mostly in the writings of Paul, but also in Acts and the writings of Peter and John as well, is that it's pictured as, a, as being like the burial and resurrection of Christ in Romans chapter 6. In Colossians chapter 2, it is for the forgiveness of sins or the remission, the remitting of sins. This would have really stood out to every Jewish person in particular because they had been taught all of their life that when that animal died up there at the temple and that blood was shed and then poured out at the altar, that's when their sins were remitted or forgiven, taken away. <coughs> now, they're being told that in Christ that happens at the moment of baptism for them specifically. That the actual sacrifice had already taken place on the cross. But it needed to be applied to each person individually and that application of the effects of the cross took place at each person's baptism. And so they were forgiven or had their sins remitted at that time. But beyond that, it also was the way of entrance into the kingdom and becoming a part of the body of Christ. Or in fact, Scripture even say, baptized into Christ Himself. And this, again, would stand out to Jewish people in particular because for them, things like being born, first of all, of the descendants of Abraham, and then as if you were a male child, to be, have been circumcised is how you entered into that uh, special group of people. But now... Something different is being uh, said. Yes, Michael. Um, to, to your comment when you spoke about John uh, not seeing the Gentiles baptized. Yeah, he just didn't seem to really be reaching out to the Gentiles. Yeah. Right, because his ministry was for, mm -hmm. he says it, right. right? I came for Israel. He prepared mm -hmm. the way in essence. Right. Um, and Jesus said that as well. Um, but we know, obviously, Jesus, I mean, prophet, we know. We know it's all inclusive mm -hmm. when you talk about Jew and Gentile. Because I was looking at um, Isaiah, I want to say that's 9, mm -hmm. when he says, uh, 9 and 1 he says, in the past land of Zebedee, and in the land of Nef Naphtali, but in the future he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. And then in uh, chapter 40, he speaks about three. He says, a voice calling uh, in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, right? Make straight mm -hmm. in the wilderness a highway for God. And now that was Isaiah, right. who surely had this, uh, this dynamic of Jew and Gentile yes. being saved mm -hmm. by the Lord. I find it uh, maybe hard-pressed that Isaiah would know and see John wouldn't make the connection. Oh, well, I wasn't saying that John didn't make the connection. I'm saying John knew what his purpose was. Right, his ministry was yeah. to yeah. these Jews. Right, yeah, his, to, his ministry to, was to prepare this people for the coming of the Messiah. Yeah, yeah. And that really did not extend essentially to the Gentiles, not right. that he didn't want the Gentiles to hear what he was saying, but uh, here was the people he was supposed to get ready. Right. Because right. he was going to come to the Jews first. Right, gotcha. And he was going to come from among them. And I think that's, he, he just stayed focused on what his ministry his was. The ministry that the Lord gave yeah. him, right? Yeah. And it's a very short one, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, I entered ministry when I was about 21, 22 years old. I'm 70 years old now. If somebody told me when I entered ministry, okay, you got three years and then you're dead. <laughs> I don't mean just figuratively speaking, I mean literally. Do you want to sign up? Uh, maybe I'll reconsider being an electrical engineer like I was originally planning on being. 
<laughs> at that point, you know. But, you know, a ministry that's very short, and, and so was Jesus's as it turned out, only three years. But world changing. World changing. But the early church really was steeped in the understanding of what baptism was all about. That's why it's mentioned so much. And not just in the book of Acts, but throughout the, uh, the epistles in various ways. Peter will talk about the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. King James version of that. 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. And uh, such. Yes, Sean. It's curious to me what you brought up earlier. The fact that there was Jewish baptisms or what they called baptisms. Yeah. So, washings. The washings and so on and so forth. And, uh, like there was a woman that I had a Bible study with and she was hung up on baptism. And like, no, 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 I know what that is. And it was, she went in to say that it, from her beliefs and understandings that it had to do with some sort of tribal ceremony that a father washed his daughter after she was being done prostituted or something like that. I'm like, okay, so we that's that application here. Look, here's what the word means. So she's like, yeah, that's what they did under the start, you know, it's full submersion. I'm like, okay, so the concept is there. You understand the definition now. It's applied to scripture. We ended up moving on and it was like, there was a little wrestling with it, but I mean, it was like light bulb. She's like, mm -hmm. oh. And, 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 and what's interesting is, like I said, you drew that out. So I'm thinking in my mind, like, you know, what if I was, you know, one of these uh, what, Hebraic, Hebraic Jews? And it's like, you know, like, you know we've seen Christ walking mm -hmm. all around and then his crucifixion and then he was walking around again. And, you know, there, there's this new teaching of baptism. And it's like, I wonder how difficult or how these people had to wrestle with not just the resurrection, but like the, the concept of, well, well, don't we do this anyway? And, mm -hmm. and like the, just yeah. the whole difference, it, it's really interesting. Yeah, it was a, a monumental task Jesus was undertaking in his three-year ministry. It wasn't just to introduce baptism to people and, mm -hmm. and, and get out the word that somehow people all over the world needs to be baptized. But he had to get people, first of all, to understand who he was and therefore that he had the authority to establish all that he's going to be saying. This is the same challenge Moses had, but he had 40 years to sort it out. Right. And Jesus had three. And so, you know, with what happened at coming out of Egypt, at Sinai, 40 years in the wilderness, on the edge of the Jordan River, ready to go into the uh, Holy Land, people are finally persuaded that, that Moses is the authority on this subject and that God really has spoken through him, so we better do what he says. Mm -hmm. Jesus had three years to do the same thing. I wonder if they had a bet going on before Jesus came down. I was like, I know I can do it three. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that they had a bet going on, but I would say that, that the it seems to me the Scriptures intimate, you know, by intimate, I don't mean it's not clearly stated, but it seems to imply that even the angels in heaven didn't know what was happening. When Jesus, they had been kept out of the loop by the Father and the Son for sure about all that was going to happen. And Satan certainly was out of the loop. Because right. he finally says, man, I've, I've been working for the last three years to kill this guy. He comes down from heaven. He's going to change everything. I work, 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 and finally get the Jews all worked up to a point where they're going to take him and arrest him and kill him. And then he finds out three days later that was God's plan all the time for him to do it. And God was just manipulating him and letting him do that. Yeah, drop. Boom. <laughs> Take that. Exactly. And so I think, you know, and yet that's exactly what God accomplished in Christ and, and the world changes and man's relationship to God changes because of that. And that comes out of the New Testament then into the next century. The apostles are dying off. The original evangelists and witnesses to Jesus are dying. Jesus is, of course, already going back to heaven. They're waiting for His return. They don't know how long that's going to be. But they're going to continue this practice. They're going to continue the Great Commission into every century, including even now, of teaching people that, that believers in Jesus Christ need to be baptized, to enter into this relationship with Him, and while not all Christianity has done it, a significant part has in one way or the other still attached forgiveness of sins to the baptism act.
even if they've changed the act from immersion to sprinkling or whatever it might be, they still say that's when you're forgiven. That's what they say in the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church. That's still what's being said in the Catholic Church. Uh, there's actually more Protestant groups than you might believe who are still saying that, and we're one of them. You know? There, there are a number of Protestant groups who still who believe today that baptism is the point at which forgiveness of sins takes place. Yeah, that, that's what I'm trying to say. Well, no matter what I said, but that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> and, I'm just saying it's we're still connected yeah. over yeah. 2,000 years by this sort of umbilical cord or the way, this power cord all the way back to the New Testament wall plug mm -hmm. about what baptism does and the power that it has. <laughs> Good illustration, brother. I've just seen that umbilical cord. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and so, you know, while there's so many more things to be said about this, uh, why the church started baptizing infants, so why the church... Uh, does a lot of things. We've already made the point earlier in the class today and an earlier class as well that the church started saying that it's not the one who does the baptizing that makes the difference ultimately, but the, the act itself and the reason for that act. But it's interesting that in the Catholic Church they've sort of abandoned the reason for the act part of that because with baptizing infants, all they're doing is wondering what's going on. People's pouring water over me. They, there's no faith there being practiced. And so the church had to develop a whole set of doctrines to cover that and so forth. Yep. And so, so then when the Anabaptists come, come along and some of the others who said, no, you know, baptism was by, of believers. And so that means it needs to be adults or those old enough to make that uh, decision on their own. And we're still of that similar persuasion today among us. So... Uh, baptism is something that just about in any Christian group you go into, even if they have variations in how they practice it or even what they say is accomplished at the moment the baptism takes place, that it is something we have in common. It's one of the almost universals in Christianity. Well, after we take our break here, we're going to look at the other near universal uh, in Christianity, and that is the communion or the Lord's Supper and how that both was ordained at the beginning, but also how it's carried on down through three, uh, you know, 2,000 years from that beginning point. Okay, so let's go ahead and take our break.